Hello everyone, welcome to Power Electronics Tutorials. In this video, I am going to discuss the BJT Base Drive Control Techniques. Before we begin, let us understand what is the need for base drive control. From our previous discussion, we have learned that saturating charge reduces the switching speed of the transistors. It is possible to increase the switching speed of the transistor using proper base drive control techniques. Particularly, the base current peaking technique can be used to reduce the turn on time T on as well as the turn off time T off. A typical arrangement for the base current waveform is as shown in the figure 1 here. The base current peaking during the turn on creates low forced beta at the beginning causing the base current to peak. Once the transistor turns on, the forced beta can be increased to a sufficiently high value to maintain the transistor in quasi saturation region. A similar procedure can also be used for reducing the turn off time T off. Higher the value of the current IB2, smaller will be the storage time. Some of the commonly used techniques for optimizing the base drive of a transistor are turn on control, turn off control, proportional base control and lastly anti saturation control. Let us now discuss each one of them in much detail. I'll start with the turn on control. The circuit that is shown in figure 2 here provides base current peaking during both turn on as well as turn off. One of the interesting features of this circuit is that it provides equal turn on and turn off times. Assume that the input voltage Vb is increased from 0 to V1 at time t is equals to 0. At this instant, the capacitor is shorted and therefore the base current flows through the capacitor. Therefore, the base current at time t is equals to 0 is limited only by the resistor R1 because capacitor shorts R2. Let us now write an equation for this initial current and let it be denoted as IB0. To write an expression for IB0, I will apply KVL to the base diameter loop that will be VB minus of VB equals to IB into R1. Now VB is equals to V1 and only R1 comes into picture and therefore by rearranging the KVL equation, I will obtain the initial current which is IB0 as V1 minus VBE divided by R1. Coming back to the circuit, as the time increases, the capacitor starts to charge and the base current starts to reduce. This is because as the capacitor starts to charge, a voltage starts to build up across the same and the resistance R2 will slowly start coming into picture. So, as time increases, the overall resistance seen by the base of the transistor starts to increase. At the time when the capacitor is completely charged, it acts as a voltage source and therefore the base current is now limited by both R1 and R2. Let the current at this particular time be denoted as IB1 and this IB1 is given by V1 minus VBE divided by R1 plus R2. This can once again be obtained by applying KVL to the base to emitter loop. The voltage across the capacitor when it is fully charged is given by VC is approximately equal to V1 multiplied by R2 divided by R1 plus R2. Also, the time taken by the capacitor to charge from 0 to Vc, which is the final capacitor voltage, is given by tau1 equals R1 R2 divided by R1 plus R2 multiplied by C1. Coming back to the circuit diagram, I said that this circuit can also be used for turn off control. Let us understand how that works. When the input voltage is changed from plus V1 volt to minus V2 volt, the capacitor voltage is now added to the input voltage Vb which is equals to minus V2 and therefore a larger negative voltage is seen across the base of the transistor. This causes the base current to peak during the turn off as well as shown in the diagram here. In the meantime, the capacitor will also discharge from the previous value of V2 through the R2 and charges to the current applied input voltage which is minus V2 volts. 
the discharging time constant of the capacitor can be now given as tau2 equals R2 multiplied by C1. To allow the capacitor to charge and discharge sufficiently, the widths of the base pulse during the turn on and turn off must be greater than tau1 and tau2 respectively. Remember that this circuit provides equal turn on and turn off times. On the other hand, if you want a different turn on and turn off times, then you will use a circuit as shown in the figure here. The circuit construction is very similar to what we have for the turn on control, except that we have more components added. The diode D1 is a very important component here because it isolates the turn on time and turn off time. Looking into the diagram for the input applied voltage VB, when the voltage is positive, the diode D1 is turned on and all of these components will come into picture to estimate the turn on time. On the other hand, when the voltage is changed to minus V2, which is during the turn off, the diode D1 is reverse biased and only these components will come into picture for computing the turn off time. Therefore, you will obtain a different turn on and turn off times using the circuit modification as shown in the diagram here. The third base drive control is the proportional base drive control. You should note both of the previously discussed base drive controls are constant base drive controls. When I say constant base drive, if you look at the input voltage waveforms, they are continuous waveforms. Therefore, for these techniques, if there is a change in the load current, the base current does not change. The solution for this condition is the proportional base drive control. In proportional base drive control technique, the base current IB changes in proportion to the collector current whenever there is a change in the load. Coming to the operation, when switch S1 is closed for a short duration, a pulse current of short duration is generated that passes through the transformer windings and drives the base of the transistor Q1. The transistor Q1 turns on and enters the saturation. When the collector current starts to flow, a proportional amount of base current is induced into the base transistor due to the transformer action. The transistor would then self-sustain due to the transformer action and the switch S1 now can be switched off. The turns ratio of the transformer is given by N2 divided by N1 which is also equal to IC divided by IB and this is equals to beta. For proper operation, the magnetizing currents due to the transformer action must be as small as possible. Please note that this particular type of technique only uses a pulse drive control because of the transformers involved in the circuit. Since a transformer works on the principle of mutual induction, once there is a current introduced into N3, it will introduce a current into N2 which will drive the transistor Q1 which will generate current IC, that is the collector current. When the collector current starts to flow, that creates a current across the winding CN2, which in turn will create a current across winding N3. This current is again passed to the winding N1 because of the transformer action. Therefore, we say that a very small pulse of voltage is sufficient enough to drive the transistor into saturation, and once the transistor enters saturation, the switch S1 can be opened, and still the transistor will continue to operate in the saturating region. Another important feature of the proportional base drive control technique is that if the load resistance changes, the value of IC would change and therefore a proportional amount of current is introduced into the winding N3 and thereby again a proportional amount is introduced into N1. That is why this technique is called as proportional base drive control technique. Lastly, we move on to anti-saturation base drive control technique. In high voltage BJTs, the amount of storage time is a function of minority carrier concentration in the base region just before the turn off and fault time is a function of base drive current turn off characteristic. The storage time can be decreased by minimizing the concentration of minority charge carriers in the base region. 
This can be accomplished by opening the transistor in soft saturation or quasi-saturation rather than hard saturation. One of the techniques that can be used to achieve this is the Baker's clamp. A typical circuit arrangement for the clamping action for the Baker's clamp circuit is as shown in the figure 5 here. In the Baker's clamp circuit, the collector to emitter voltage is clamped to a predetermined level and the collector current is given by applying the KVL to the collector emitter loop which is given by the equation IC equals VCC minus of VCM divided by RC where VCM is the clamping voltage and VCM should be greater than the VCE saturation. The base current IB which is sufficient enough to drive the transistor into hard saturation can be obtained by applying KVL to the base emitter loop. Therefore, the base current IB will be equal to current I1 and this can be obtained by applying KVL to the base emitter loop. So, IB is given by the equation VB minus VD1 minus VBE divided by RB. Once you find the value of IB, you can write an equation for the collector current IC because they are related by the equation IC is equals to beta IB. Please note in the absence of diode D2, the collector current equals the load current and therefore we have written IC equals to IL which is equals to beta IB. Once the collector current starts to rise, the transistor is said to be turned on. Once the transistor turns on, the collector current starts to rise and clamping takes place because now the diode D2 will be far best. The collector to emitter voltage is now given by VBE, VD1 and VD2. In the equation form, this will be VCE equals VBE plus VD1 minus VD2. In a very similar fashion, we can write an expression for the load current IL. Please note it is now different from the collector current IC because the diode D2 is turned on and this in fact is our clamping diode. So the equation for IL is obtained by applying KVL to the collector emitter circuit which is given by IL equals VCC minus VCE divided by RC. Now I will substitute equation 8 for VCE here and therefore the load current equation is VCC minus VBE minus VD1 plus VD2 whole divided by RC. Let us now once again write the equation for collector current which is still the same which is beta IB. But now the value of IB has changed because IB in the presence of diode is equal to I1 minus of I2 and I2 is equals to IC minus of IL. So the collector current is given by the equation IC equals to beta IB which is equals to beta into I1 minus I2. But I2 is equals to IC minus IL, therefore IC here is beta multiplied by I1 minus IC plus IL. After simplifying this, we will obtain the value for the collector current as beta divided by 1 plus beta multiplied by I1 plus IL. Now, in a very important note, when I compare the RHS of equation 11, which is the collector current after clamping, with the RHS of equation 7, which is also the collector current equation, but before clamping, I will find that the collector current after clamping has reduced compared to that of the before clamping. This is very important because the collector current is now clamped so that the transistor does not enter hard saturation. In fact, that is the overall idea behind using diode D2. By connecting diode D2 across the base and collector, we make sure that the collector current is clamped to a predetermined value so that the transistor will not enter hard saturation and will only work in the quasi saturation which is also called as the soft saturation. Now, having understood the importance of clamping, let us understand what are the requirements for clamping. For clamping to be successful, the voltage across the diode D1 should be greater than the voltage across the diode D2. If we have used exact same diodes in place of diodes D1 and D2, then you can increase the voltage across diode D1 by simply connecting another diode in series with diode D1. Also, the load resistance RC must satisfy the condition given by beta IB, which is nothing but IC, greater than IL. 
Now, I will substitute for IEL from one of my previous equations, precisely equation 9 here. And before I substitute, I will take the denominator that is RC towards the LHS here. So, beta IB multiplied by RC is greater than VCC minus VBE minus VD1 plus VD2. Comparing equation 13, which is nothing but the equation for the collector current IC with the collector current equation before clamping, we find that the numerator in equation 5, that is before clamping, is considerably higher than after clamping. Therefore, we now state that the clamping action reduces the collector current while almost eliminating the storage time. This will provide a faster turn on time for our transistor. Right. So, that is about a brief discussion on the base drive control techniques of a BJT. Thank you.